sermon is the law of love. You know, we, most of us, would call ourselves non-resistant Anabaptist Christians. And what does that exactly mean? I'd like to challenge that um, non-resistance part this morning. Are we non-resistant? Am I non-resistant? Sadly, we have become all too accustomed to seeing headlines in our nation's news about retaliation and brutality and excessive force. But occasionally, this comes closer to home for us. And maybe some of us know people who have um, killed someone out of retaliation. And whenever there is murder or that kind of excessive force, um, it is almost always a result of escalated retaliation. Usually the original offense was nowhere near a murder. Maybe it was a, a bad breakup or a bill that didn't get paid and it resulted in excessive retaliation. Human nature tends to escalate retaliation. Here's an example. If you and I were sitting at a table one hot summer day and I had just finished a glass of ice cold water and there's three drops of water in the bottom of that glass that need a home. So out of compassion for those three homeless drops of water, I toss them in your direction. What do I have coming back? Three little drops of water? Probably not. Most likely it's a full glass. And so because you're going to play that way, I reach for the pitcher. And I uh, really douse you. You run for the hose, and it all ends with me throwing you in a pool. You see the, the escalation in retaliation. What started with just three simple homeless drops of water didn't stop until we were in 50,000 gallons of water. And all because you retaliated in escalation. Can you picture a water battle? that doesn't escalate? Are we gonna sit at that table all day and just toss drops of water back and forth? Of course not. Retaliation is almost always escalated. It's pretty hard for a country to uh, go to war and win without escalating the retaliation. And we know that when two countries are outside on a hot day sitting at a table, and one country tosses three drops of water in the other country's face. The, res the results are not pretty. Well, our rich Anabaptist heritage gives testimony to the biblical teaching of non-resistance, both by not participating in war and by how we treat those with, uh, who wish to harm us personally. And recently, I learned that from this area, during World War II, there were some folks... Uh, some, uh, a small group of men who voluntarily participated uh, in the war. And I wondered why. If we teach and practice non-resistance, how could that uh, happen? What is the cause of that? Do I have a proper understanding of non-resistance? Or have we slightly misrepresented or confused or limited the teaching of not retaliating just to the horror of war, but in our relationships, we are not living under the law of love? I also feel like sometimes we confuse non-resistance to mean that I'm allowed to be passive. And maybe you, like I do, struggle with spiritual passivity in your life. But let me remind you that there are some things that we need to resist. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Ephesians six twelve. For we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, we are not to be passive, and love is not passive, and non-resistance is not passive. Matthew 5, tells us to love, bless, 
do good to and pray for our persecutors. That is not a passive portion of scripture. Today I'd like to look at the teaching found in Matthew 5, and without minimizing uh, the teaching on not participating in war, I would like to focus on non-resistance in our relationships, in our everyday lives, because I feel strongly that if we don't, uh, if it doesn't become a part of our heart, then the non-resistance um, is just convenient when it comes to war, but we're not actually non-resistant in our relationships. We'll begin by looking uh, at a Latin word, lex talionis, which is the law of retaliation as given in the Old Testament. In Genesis 9, verse 6, Noah was receiving instructions from the Lord on how to live after the flood. And God introduced some measures of restraint. He said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And I like to look at several portions of Scripture where um, God gives in the Old Testament the law of retaliation. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, verse 22 to 27. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished. According as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge is determined. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. Another uh, place that we can read about lex talionis, or the law of retaliation, is given in Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24, and verse 17. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death, and he that killeth a beast shall make it good beast for beast. And if a man calls a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him, breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And we see these uh, familiar phrases, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And in Judges uh, chapter 1, there is um, a portion of scripture which describes an account of Adonai Bezek, a Canaanite king, who when they captured, they cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And he goes on to tell, tell us that uh, this was God's judgment on him because he had cut off the thumbs and big toes of the kings that he had captured. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 4, where the first murder is recorded. Genesis chapter 4, verse 11, and this is uh, the Lord talking to Cain. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be as a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Cain understood, and he should, human nature, that retaliation is coming his way. 
God then marked Cain to protect him from retaliation. And I believe that lex talionis, the law of retaliation, was given by God not to justify revenge, but as a means to end feuds and to prevent, I believe, that human nature tendency of escalated retaliation. I think we could agree that with Martin Luther who said that if we live by lex talionis, we are all quickly blind and toothless. I'd like to talk about a second law, and this is where we come to the title of the sermon, Lex Amoris, another Latin phrase meaning law of love. And we read about this in Matthew 5. And we as followers of Christ need to constantly be moving away from Lex Talionis, the law of retaliation, toward the law of love. Now, before we turn to Matthew 5, I want to look at Leviticus chapter 19, where we can realize that the law of love is not just a New Testament principle. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear grudge against the children of thy people but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. The God-given law did not state that they were to hate their enemies. And I think that was an addition that was outside of Scripture, and perhaps that's why Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, and not it hath been said, in Matthew 5.43. There seems to have been uh, some debate as to whether Lex Talionis the law of retaliation, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, should be taken literally, or if there was uh, a monetary substitution that was to be paid in proportion to the crime. And in Jesus' day, the debate seems to have completely missed the point and was uh, being used, I believe, as um, a way to justify revenge or hatred. And it's my concern that just as they missed the point in Jesus' day, have we missed the point in our understanding of non-resistance and a non-resistant lifestyle. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 5 and look at three areas that Jesus referenced regarding Lex Amoris or the law of love. The first area that Jesus um, talked about is in verse 39 in Matthew chapter 5. Whosoever shall turn, whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And so in response to being struck in the face, we are to turn the other cheek. So he is referring to our person uh, or our, our body, our physical person. The second area that Jesus referenced is in verse 40. In response to being sued for your coat, the cheaper garment, uh, offer up your cloak, the more expensive one. Jesus is referring to our possessions. And in verse 41, in response to being asked by an occupying army personnel to carry their stuff for one mile, go a second mile. He's talking about our priorities. So Jesus wants those three areas of our, our lives to reflect non-resistance, our person, our possessions, and our priorities. Jesus steered the conversation away from uh, the debate of what is fair punishment to always, in every relationship, returning good when we are treated poorly or with evil intent. And notice that he seems to bring it very close to home. It's in our everyday walk, our relationships. I think the temptation is there for us to be, uh, to claim to follow the law of love when it comes to war and the horrors of war, but we tend to be retaliatory when it comes to relationships and issues of our heart. 
So basically, we have introduced the third law, which is lex commodum, the law of convenience, where when it's convenient for us to be non-resistant, we are. But when it's inconvenient, we're not. And this is uh, too often where I find my heart, if I'm honest with myself. We have an outward appearance of being non-resistant, but inwardly we are bent on retaliation and revenge. And if we want to be considered non-resistant Christians, we must first learn to give up our right to retaliation and give ourselves to the law of love, whether it is convenient or not. I'd like to look at the life of Joseph for an example of someone who lived by the law of love. And you can turn to Genesis chapter 50, and I'm just going to recount um, the background to Joseph. Uh, Dave preached a wonderful sermon here a while back and gave us a good introduction to Joseph's life and the difficulties that he faced there. Joseph was born into a complicated, dysfunctional family comprised of 12 sons and at least one daughter from four mothers, two of which were sisters who constantly competed for the affection of their husband and went to any length to have the upper hand in the family. There were brothers and stepbrothers. One of Joseph's brothers was from his mother. Some of Joseph's brothers were his mother's sister's sons, and some of his brothers were his mother's handmaid's son. Some were his mother's sister's handmaid's son. All were the son of Jacob, 12 sons by four women, competing for the affection and blessing of one father. And Joseph was the firstborn of the favorite wife. Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob, who dreamed of the other brothers bowing down to him. He also reminded his father of the brothers' lives and their poor reputation among neighboring tribes. And you can read about what these sons of Jacob did to Shechem and his clan in retaliation for how they violated their sister. So Jacob asked Joseph to check on his brothers, and he finds them uh, in Dothan. And when the brothers saw him a long way off, they conspired to kill him in retaliation for his dreams. We shall see what will become of his dreams, they said. Instead of killing him, they sold him to the Midianite merchants who sold him to Potiphar, captain of the guard in Egypt. Joseph prospered in Egypt, and Potiphar made him ruler over everything he owned. Joseph handled all the day-to-day operations, and Potiphar didn't worry about anything and didn't even know what he had except the bread he ate. Potiphar's wife lied about Joseph and had him arrested and thrown into prison. After God revealed to Joseph the meaning of Pharaoh's dreams, he was released from prison and came up with a plan to save Egypt from the famine and was promoted to second in command under Pharaoh to carry out the plan. Pharaoh said that without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. The famine was over all the land and all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy corn. So Jacob sent his sons to Egypt to buy corn so that they can live and not die. And after several trips, Joseph reveals to his brothers who he is and invites them to move to Egypt. Jacob and his family moved to Egypt, and after some time, Jacob dies. After Jacob was buried, his brothers became afraid of Joseph and are concerned that Joseph will seek retribution for what they have done now that Jacob is dead. They first sent a messenger ahead of them to talk to Joseph to tell him that before Jacob died, he said that you should forgive us. And Joseph wept when he spoke to the messenger. And when they were gone, his brothers came to Joseph, and they bowed down before Joseph, pleading for their lives, saying, Behold, we be thy servants. And after all this has taken place, Joseph, in Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 through 21, makes three comments. And I want to read that and make a few uh, remarks. There's some tremendous truths And things that will help us move from retaliation to love if we apply uh, some of these things to our life. In Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 through 21. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you... Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. 
Now therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. I think the first truth that we need to realize in moving from the law of retaliation to the law of love is to recognize the power of God. Joseph said, fear not. Am I in the place of God? In Deuteronomy 32, 35, God says, to me belong with vengeance and recompense. And if we think back into uh, the Garden of Eden, where Eve yielded to the temptation to be as God, knowing good and evil, the serpent is still deceiving today, and Christians in drove are falling for this, falling prey to this scheme of participating in revenge and retaliation. But Joseph says, I cannot retaliate against you because I am not God. I think at the core of resistance and revenge is three things. Fear, selfishness, and pride. And we understand that if we're fearful of someone or something, we um, resist. We want to protect ourselves against that fear. Selfishness, we understand if my possessions are mine, I need to protect them. If they're God's, God will protect them. And pride, um, we fall as Eve did to being as God when we take vengeance on what the Lord clearly says is his responsibility. I want to just turn to Romans chapter 12 and read a portion of scripture there. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dear beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. The second truth that we see in the life of Joseph from his comments to his brothers is that he realized that God had an ultimate plan. Uh, While people, especially his brothers, were mean to him and treated him poorly, God had a plan and a purpose for his life that trumped um, those um, wrong actions. Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He yielded to the plan of God, just like Jesus did by dying on the cross. And the key to turning someone's evil intent into good is faithful obedience to God's plan. We see that through the life of Joseph. He was faithful. He was obedient to what God asked him to do. This means that we obey when immediate blessing is not seen and in spite of what others think about us or how they treat us. We cannot be resistant to God's plan in our life or in our relationship with him. I'm sorry, we cannot be resistant to God's plan in our life and non-resistant in our relationship to others at the same time. Cain retaliated against his brother because he first resisted God's plan and his offering was not accepted. Our resistant spirit comes from a relationship with God when we resist God in our relationship with him. The third truth, the third comment that Joseph said is, I will nourish you. And I believe when we rely on God's provisions, we understand that we have uh, an obligation to share those provisions with others. Joseph had a tremendous uh, means to supply what they were lacking. And when we understand how we've been filled, the resources that we have, When we see what God has provided for us, we can share that with the people around us. However, if we have not allowed Christ to comfort us, and if we have not been filled with the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and if he does not rule in our lives, we cannot comfort others, but rather our life portrays its natural attribute of retaliation and condemnation. 
Knowing that God cares about the sparrow that falls or the withering flowers in the field empowers us to rely on the protection and provision that God provides. Earlier I mentioned three uh, areas that Jesus taught regarding lex amoris or the law of love. And they were in three areas, person, possession, and priorities. Well, let's take a closer look at the life of Christ and see if this was just a teaching or if he exemplified this in his life. First of all, we'll look at his person, his physical person. In Isaiah 50, verse 6, in a prophetic passage about the suffering of Christ, it says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Not only did Jesus teach us to turn the other cheek, but he literally gave up his person by turning the other cheek. Well, what about possessions? In John 19, 23 and 24, after Jesus gave his body or his person on the cross, the soldiers took his last earthly possession. And it says that when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Jesus literally gave up his possessions, his inner and outer garments, just like he taught in Matthew 5. The third area that Jesus taught us to give, to give up is our priorities. And we understand that Jesus was tortured and crucified, both his garments taken. And to say that he allowed himself to be taken advantage of and to be inconvenienced is a huge understatement. His priority was not in his person or in his possessions. But it is recorded in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, in response to the soldier who crucified him, he went the second mile by pleading for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His priority was again recorded in verse 43. By providing forgiveness to the repentant criminal, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And we see that Jesus literally gave up his priorities to what the Father asked him, providing salvation and forgiveness to all mankind. And when we recognize God's power, then we, like Jesus, can release our priorities to God. And we, when we realize God's plan, we can give up our earthly possessions. And when we learn to rely on God's provision, we can even give our very lives, our person, for the cause of Christ. But if we have difficulty or am unwilling to give my priorities and my possessions for the cause of Christ, I am a fool to think that I could somehow muster the courage to give my person my life for Christ. The, hypo the hypocrisy is evident when claiming to be non-resistant, we don't participate in war, but in our relationships, we demand an eye for an eye. <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 23, Jesus, it talks about Jesus, who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed to himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sin in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed, for we were as sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of our souls. When someone tortures my person and takes my possessions, and forces me to change my priorities. Am I willing to say, fear not. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Do not fear. I will nourish you and comfort you. To Joseph, being non-resistant meant that when his brothers tortured him by throwing him in a pit and took his possessions, his coat of many colors and all the earthly blessings that came with that, and changed his priorities by selling him into slavery. When they did all this, being non-resistance meant that he forgave them, he released them from fear, and provided nourishment for them. To Jesus, being non-resistant meant that when my sins nailed him to the cross, torturing his person, when my sins caused his possessions to be parted, his priority was to die so that I could have life, freedom from sin, 
and nourishment and fellowship with the Father. He died so that I can live. Am I willing to die to self, to give up all that I have, to provide freedom from fear and nourishment to those who wish evil against me? Being non-resistant may not be as easy as we think. My prayer is that like Joseph, and even more importantly, like Jesus, we too can learn to recognize the power of God. We can learn to realize the plan of God and learn to rely on the provisions of God so that we truly can make the law of love priority in our relationships to each other. Let's kneel for prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the work that you have provided for us on Calvary for giving up your life and for sacrificing your life so that we can have abundant life and fellowship with you and the Father. I pray that you would help us in our relationships with one another and um, especially within this church body that you would help us to live under the law of love and to leave retaliation and revenge um, to where it belongs. It is your responsibility and you um, have the power uh, to carry out uh, judgment. It is not our responsibility to see that the folks around us are judged. And I pray that you would help us to release that uh, retaliation into your hands and to live as Joseph and as uh, you yourself lived under the law of love. I pray that you give us the, the courage and the power to do that this next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I thank the Lord and I thank Glenn for bringing that exposition to us here this morning. I was especially challenged with the um, uh, various uh, um, references to the hypocrisy of us claiming non-resistance as a culture and as uh, our background and then um, not being non-resistant in our relationships and 